Good morning, everybody. I'm just watching as uh, people enter the, uh, the virtual um, room, if, uh, as you like. Um, welcome to the third in our series of Brodie's 10-year um, celebrations, if you like, of being in Aberdeen and celebrations of, um, of Aberdeen itself. I'm Elaine Farkson black I'm a partner in the planning team, and I'm based in our, um, in our Aberdeen office. In our first uh, webinar of this series, Nick Scott, our managing partner, and I uh, were joined by Professor George Boyne, by Russell Borthwick, by uh, Myrtle Dawes, and by Steve White. And we looked at the city itself, we looked at the, the economy, what we could do to help attract new businesses, investments, and um, to attract and retain uh, talent. And we also touched on the energy transition um, and becoming a net zero uh, city. And then the second one was hosted by my uh, fellow partner, um, Malcolm Mackay, and it focused on fishing. And so now the third one, we're going to explore the city's cultural offering and why this sector is important to Aberdeen's success and where we hope to be in, in 10 years time. And I'm delighted to be joined this morning by, uh, by three guests who are you know, heavily invested in um, encouraging and developing and, and attracting um, and making sure that we as a city kind of showcase our creative side and um, become as well known for culture and our artistic um, abilities um, as well as the oil and gas which everybody uh, seems to associate uh, with us. So I'm going to welcome uh, to the screen, um, so to speak, uh, Councillor Mary Bolton. Uh, Mary is convener of the city's uh, council's planning committee, uh, the licensing board, the capital growth committee, um, and she sits on several cultural groups, including the board of Aberdeen Performing Arts, and has a lead role for the council on uh, culture and the city centre master plan. So welcome, uh, Mary. Hey. And we've got Jane Spears. Jane is the Chief Executive of Aberdeen Performing Arts and has responsibility for His Majesty's Theatre, the Music Hall and the Lemon Tree. And you're a member of Culture Aberdeen, Jane. Thank Welcome. You. And Adrian, um, Chief Executive of Aberdeen Inspired is the Business Improvement District, uh, which covers the city um, centre. And um, on the cultural side, you've obviously been responsible for uh, bringing in a number of festivals such as New Art and, and the Comedy Festival, and we'll touch on those um, as we go through the chat this morning. So welcome to you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're going to turn to, uh, to look at culture. And I'm going to start with you, Mary, um, if we can. And it's really a little bit of a kind of background, as much to see how far we've come and where we're going. Um, and I'm going to take you back to 2013. Um, and we submitted a bid to become the UK culture, uh, City of Culture um, for 2017. And the bid was backed by artists such as Billy Connolly and Emily Sandy, Dame Evelyn, Glennie, Stuart McBride. Um, but it wasn't successful and, and Hull was ultimately appointed. And I, I don't think a Scottish city has ever actually got a, a, awarded it. Can you tell us a little bit about why the city decided to go for, um, you know, being appointed as the UK City of Culture and what we've learned from the process? Okay, well, you know, we were fortunate at the time that we had a chief exec in Valerie Watts who had just done the, the Derry, London Derry bid for the UK and had been successful. Um, and, and we were very aware that Aberdeen's kind of persona was oil and gas. And we wanted to be able to say there's there, there's more to Aberdeen than oil and gas and you know culture we, we were recognizing was being more and more featured in successful cities you know we we're seeing things moving um I think quite quickly away from just the sciences to arts having as, as much an economic driver as well as a, a well-being driver so you know it was for us to I suppose focus our attention and to get the world to look at Aberdeen in a different light. So that's kind of why we went to the City of Culture. Now, yes, we weren't successful, but you know, the feedback that we got was that we had all the raw ingredients, that you know, that we had huge potential for the future. But I think Aberdonians are actually quite um, shy and retiring in many ways. We don't like to shout, shout what we've got. And we hid an awful lot of our cultural endeavors under a bushel and kind of kept it to ourselves. But I think the city of culture made us confront what we had, lay it all on a table and say, well, my goodness, well, look at what we have as a, as a region, never mind just as a city. And, and that gave us the inspiration, I think, to make sure regardless of whether we were successful or not in the city of culture bid, that we would absolutely showcase and put the front um, on the front of our agenda culture for the city. And that's what we did. And you know, whilst we weren't successful, we still we we put two and a half million pounds 
into a fund, which meant that we could actually pursue the four themes that we had identified. One of them was placemaking, and, and that was about creating space for artists of all performance, you know, could be music, could be uh, drawing, that, it didn't matter what it was, but any of you with an artistic bent, we wanted to make sure it felt welcome and provided for in the city. We also looked at marketing and communication of the city and making sure that we were telling the story of the, the cultural offering here. We also building on our strengths that we had already identified. And the final one was looking at signature events. And that led to us doing an evaluation of what was on offer all year round and identifying where we had maybe empty parts of the year and looking at, at signature events to fill those. So, you know, whilst yes, it, it wasn't, um, a success if you if you base it on did you get it but I think it yes. was an absolute success in identifying how rich we were in cultural offering and partners and what mm -hmm. we needed to do to to make the world more aware of it yeah yeah so Jane um, I'll turn to you because you you arrived in the city around about the same time 2020 uh, 2012 2013 um, and you'd come from Perth and Stirling where you know, you'd won awards for um, the the work that you'd done there and since coming here, just building on what Mary was saying in those kind of dark spots, you, you, you've brought three city festivals, um, True North, which is music, and uh, Granite Noir, which is about books, and then Light the Blue, uh, which is youth arts. And you've been involved in the, the £9 million restoration of the Music Hall. And in 2019, Aberdeen Performing Arts was uh, named Business of the Year um, in the Northeast at the Northern Star Awards. And you were given a lifetime achievement award, so um, which 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 is fabulous. So, coming into the city, then at that point, what what was your view of the of the city's cultural offering, yeah. and how important was it for you to get those those dark areas lit by the festivals? Well, first of all, thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> but, you know, just picking up on the city of culture very briefly first. I mean, lots of cities don't win but they all get lots out of the experience. So, you know, Dundee didn't win, Belfast, Norwich, Paisley didn't win, but what we all have in common is that we recognize and appreciate the role that arts and culture play, you know, in economic development, in delivering um, social change, in creating community well-being. So, you know, I came to Aberdeen, um, as you say, nine years ago, and I didn't feel that I was coming to a city that had any, you know, historical cultural challenges. From the outside looking in, Aberdeen had a lot to offer culturally. You know, coming to Aberdeen and realising, you know, just how oil and gas dominated Aberdeen was, I could see that it was a struggle for any sector, including arts and culture, to have a voice. You know, everything was perceived as being part of a supply chain for oil and gas. In my first week, I was introduced to someone and um, um, they said to me, they worked in oil and gas, and they said, yeah, but what do you actually do in oil and gas? And this guy said, I'm a graphic designer. And I was absolutely flummoxed. You know, I thought, you know, you work in the creative industries and you describe yourself as working in oil and gas. But of course, you know, I realized that's who employed him. That's where his work came from. So, you know, in that context, the city of culture bid, as Mary said, you know, was a rallying call for the cultural sector. It gave us a platform and it gave us an opportunity for a stronger voice. And looking back on it now, you know, we've gone on to deliver many of the ambitions that were set out in that bid and things like cultural strategy, cultural Aberdeen, investing in the physical infrastructure, uh, festivals. And, you know, I confess I was aware um, when I got the job that there was a bit of a standoff going on at the time between the business community and the arts community over Union Terrace Gardens. <laughs> um, but that didn't actually put me off, you know, quite the reverse. You know, I want to be in a city where people care enough about the arts to have an opinion, to stand up and be counted. You know, apathy is the, is the enemy. So, you know, I felt when I came to the city nine years ago that I was coming to a cultural scene that had a lot to offer you know our venues as you've said HMT the music hall the lemon tree they're all really iconic um you know in fact they're the envy of many cities I took the executive director of the Belgrade theatre in Coventry which is currently um the UK city of culture around the music hall just before we opened our doors and her reaction was wow you know 
Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, so I, yeah, I felt, you know, I came here and I felt there was a lot of potential and you, you, you touched on the festivals that, yeah. that you know, we, we've set up. You know, I, I feel that um, festivals are literally in Aberdeen's DNA. They've always been part of the cultural offering in the city. They're incredibly well suited to a city like Aberdeen, which has got so many unique places and spaces to host and stage mm -hmm. events. And, you know, we produced three festivals, as, as you mentioned, and literally when we stage these festivals, we don't just stage them in our venues. All the city is a stage for us. So, you know, we host events in the Maritime Museum, in the gallery, mm -hmm. in the Carmelite Hotel, um, you know, in Marshall Square, in the Sheriff Courts, you know, just they're absolutely sort of um, beautiful historic um, venues that you know they've got bags of character and they really add to the atmosphere of the festival so for me that's what makes a festival city and our festivals that they're destination festivals they're about selling Aberdeen yeah and you know, just returning to what's uh, different um, to 10 years ago there's been a wonderful explosion of festivals in the city over the last few years. You know, we've got originals, we've got trailblazers like the Jazz Festival, Sound, Dance Slide, but we've now got festivals like Look Again, like New Art, like Spectra, we've got the Comedy Festival, we've got our three festivals. And we all take our inspiration from, um, from the creative talent that we have in the city and from our surroundings. And fantastic, they're, they're just a fantastic opportunity to celebrate the arts, the festivals, like the anime, the city centre. And our festivals, we celebrate dance, we celebrate music, we celebrate literature, spoken word. I mean, that's a city of culture, you know, and we do yeah. that with, with real authenticity and inclusivity. Our festivals are from the ground up in this city. They're not parachuted in or bought in. They're originated in Aberdeen. Um, and within all the programmes um, that we have, you'll see opportunities to showcase local talent, you know, sitting alongside Scottish artists and internationally renowned artists and performers on the bill. And, you know, not to forget, actually, and I'm sure Adrian will come on to talk about this, you know, festivals are an integral part of the visitor economy in the city. You know, over the weekend of Granite Noir in 2020, we sold 12,000 tickets for a book festival, mm -hmm. you know, and we attracted people from all over the UK and, yeah. and, and actually all over the world, you know, from New Zealand to, uh, to, to Norway. And we didn't want to lose that momentum this year. It was really disappointing not to be able to yeah. stage a live festival in the city. But we had a kind of mini version of Granite Noir that we live streamed over a weekend 15,000 people tuned in from 52 countries. You know, that's Amazing. There's such a buzz to see yeah. Q&A and questions coming in live from sort of Bulgaria, Turkey, South Africa, the States. You know, that again, that's putting Aberdeen on, on the map. And we talk about, you know, restructuring and kind of uh, diversifi diversifying our economy post oil and gas, post COVID. You know, we, we talk about, um, you know, restructuring, reimagining the city centre. I mean, the, the cultural and the creative sector is already on it, you know. And hasn't that then COVID highlighted the importance of community? You know, festivals bring us all together. They're good for the soul. Yes, yeah, and and, and Adrian, as, as Jane mentioned, obviously, um, in terms of Aberdeen Inspired, um, you brought a, a lot to the city centre. Um, you know, I liked um, when Jane said there, you know, all the city is a stage. I think, Adrian, you've you've made sure that that's the case. And you are no stranger to awards yourself um, <laughs> in terms of the bid. You know, since you took over in 2016, we've won a clutch of uh, national and international um, industry awards. European Bid of the Year 2017-2018, International Downtown Association Global Merit Award in 2018. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about Aberdeen Inspired and, you know, the, the festivals and, you know, that, just as Jane mentioned, you know, how culture plays a major part in the recovery and the reinvention and, and, and revival of the city centre? I think Jane's covered all the bases there, really. Uh, but <laughs> Nice of you as well to mention these awards because it'll save me doing it. <laughs> uh, but, but as an organisation, Aberdeen Inspired, we're one of those mythical business improvement districts. And I suppose we come in from a slightly different angle. And as you rightly say, I came here in 2016. We had a great team. Uh, we were very much part of that Team Aberdeen ethos. 
uh, but we needed to revisit because we do five year cycles as a business improvement district. We needed to revisit our priorities and it was made very clear to us by our then 900 or so levy payers who pay a levy every year and these are the businesses in the city centre that cultural events was one of those priorities that they wanted to see. Building on as Jane and Maria both said a uh, very successful cultural offering already uh, but maybe slightly different and if you think about what our raising debtor is as an organisation, is to bring the masses into the city centre, as you'd expect, to increase economic vibrancy. Get them in, as my boss says, get them to dwell here. And with that, as clinical as it sounds, spend money. And then all the superlatives in our business plan will be met for that five years. So we embarked through that cultural strand in our priorities uh, on new art, the International Street Art Festival. And, and you know, Cutting a long story short, the curator is in our strategic city of Stavanger up in Norway. He hadn't really ventured out to Scandinavia before, but saw Aberdeen as, if you allow me, a blank canvas. And was very keen to work with Aberdeen Inspired and the partners that you see present here today and many others in bringing some of the finest street artists uh, to the grey granite city, as some would see it, of Aberdeen. And we did that in 2017. Uh, we had a forerunner before that, that was the Painted Doors, that incremental approach, just to see how people would react to uh, art uh, on the side of buildings, doors, as it was, as was the case there, of course, uh, and it seemed to be well received. So, you know, we took that bold and ambitious step. We unleashed these street artists from across the world onto the city centre of Aberdeen, and it wasn't onto our uh, much-loved granite, but it was maybe... Uh, the buildings round the corner, if you will, in some areas that would probably benefit from that splendour. Uh, and, and that was very helpful in itself. Uh, and the festival came together, and dare I say the rest is history, it was really, it captured the imagination beyond any of our expectations, not only to the city people, the wider northeast and nationally. And that goes back to Jane and Mary's point about Aberdeen reimagining itself, if you will pushing beyond oil and gas, although it's still robust and resilient and still brings many benefits in the Northeast, but, you know, going down a different road, dare I say. And of course, if you think about our key objectives, that was bringing people in to the city centre, not only to see the splendour of new art, I'm sure everybody has been captivated and it's, it's tuning in today with it, and if not, grab that opportunity. But, you know, they were coming in in their thousands and they were staying in our hotels. They were uh, using the retail, uh, and they were using the hospitality. And it's just back to Jane's point, you know, and that in itself helps the economic vibrancy. And we are achieving our objectives as a business improvement industry as part of that bigger picture. We're also involving many local artists. Yeah. We involved the schools over the years. It appealed to all demographics and it really has captured the imagination, as I said. Jane touched on it as well. We, we then took a comedy festival, uh, Small Beginnings, Modest, mm -hmm. uh, to an international comedy festival. And again, great support from Jane at the APA, Aberdeen Performing Arts. Uh, we, we built it up to a, a state now where there are about 65 shows, some of the best comedians in the world. It's in October, whether it's this October, we still wait to see, but it's in October. So we always say, tongue in cheek almost, the fringes that are warm up in September for the great Aberdeen International. <laughs> But, you know, Mary's right. It would have been easy for us then to self-actualize and go off and do our own thing. But there, there, there needed to be some discipline and rigor here because we're trying to build the city. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I speak about partners, but we had the 365 group as well, which Mary touched on, is bringing us all around so we can synchronize. Never stymie initiative or creativity. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But we're all aware of who's doing what and we can complement and build on each other's offerings. You know, we will support the APA to the nth degree because it's in our interests to do just that. You know, we have those relationships, that collegiate approach. And I think slow but sure people are understanding that Aberdeen has so much more to offer anyway. Yeah. And 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 Mary kind of building on that and the kind of refresh of the city centre, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're doing the city centre master plan, which um, you're kind of leading on. And that's about bringing people back into the city centre and also that diversification. And, and, and so is it fair to say that culture actually plays quite a big part in that diversification? It's not what everybody immediately would think of when we talk about the city centre master plan, 
but actually yeah. the culture has got a central plank in that. Yeah. It has, and I mean, I've I've never um, wavered from my kind of uh, belief that this the, the the culture is actually the heart of the city centre master plan, because it's about activity that takes place in a city. It's not about the buildings, um, you know. And you know, we've heard Jane obviously mentioned the fact that we've got some amazing buildings, amazing open spaces to use, and you know, I wouldn't take anything away from that. But it's a, the activity that drives the economy of a city, you know. And, and again, Adrian touched on. You know the fact that when people come into our festivals they're not just spending money in the festival they're spending it in our restaurants you know they're overnighting in our hotels you know going into our shops doing a little bit of retail therapy so you know what we're trying to do is make the city center a destination of experience and, and, and culture absolutely um you know plays a, a huge part in that and even with the next phase of the master plan cultural will remain at the heart of it because again, as I say, it's about the activity that's driven. Now we haven't touched on, obviously we have our Christmas market. And again, there's you know, a variation of offering there, but I would draw your attention to the market that we have, again, which is an opportunity for local crafters mm -hmm. um, to make sell their goods. So, you know, it's about offering them the opportunity to showcase themselves. You know, just recently, in fact, Monday, um, the art gallery reopened. And on the top floor, we've created a really exciting shop called a shop at the top uh -huh. um, and it's got four local um, designers now there's one artist one is uh, created scarves and uh, another is doing uh, bags and purses and things there's another one that's doing pictures there's one doing jewelry there's one doing ceramics now the team at the art gallery selected these artists to work you know showcase for three months then what we've agreed is they'll then appoint choose the next to replace them. So, you know, it's about showing unique um, options for people if they want a bit of retail therapy. We had the hand festival in there at Christmas time, which again was local um, crafters, again, which is hugely popular in the area. So, you know, we're, we're constantly making sure that we, we give the local talent as much. Now, Adrian touched on new art and, you know, let's all be honest, there was a slight resentment by some people feeling we were parachuting some, you know, a, 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 a festival in. But actually, you know, when you looked at it in, in more detail, what we were doing is we were, we were it's a starting point. And we, Adrian said, we've included schools. We had the graffiti grannies who were on the show, uh, number, uh, what's it, the one show. Um, you know, we've had the schools involved, we've had local artists involved, and what we see this is, it, you know, everything's got a starting point, but it's how we progress it, you know, and it's absolutely about everybody benefiting, and, you know, what I'd love, I mean, Granite Noir is, was, is one of my favourite uh, festivals, which Jane knows, because it's not just about a literacy festival, it's become about historic events, you know, we have our archives, which we've got UNESCO status for being showcased, uh, you know, we've had the court cases, which sold out so quickly, yeah. but, you know, and uh, the people just wanted to go in you were in the actual court that this case took place all those years ago all dressed up the, the actors in the period costumes but it was the, you know the appetite by people to go to this has been has been phenomenal phenomenal get the words out but you know it's about growing these things and, and making sure that you know in the hospitality that they've maybe got the granite noir um menu we've seen beers for granite noir ice cream by mackie for granite noir so you know everybody's got on board to make sure yeah. that this happens um yeah. so you know aberdeen you know will always um be i suppose beholden to the oil and gas because it has brought an awful lot of benefits to the city but aberdeen is a city that constantly reinvents itself it never stands still it's always looking to the future and i think that's what's really positive and Adrian touched on the 365 um, group, which I chair. And that's, you know, all the partners that are involved in either sports or the arts or obviously Aberdeen inspired in making sure that the city is, is busy 365 days a year so for the benefit of the hospitality, the benefit of the retail. But, you know, what we do do is we sit around that table, we discuss what we've got on, we, we work out, so, well, I could help you with that, you know, oh, I didn't know you were doing that. You know, so it is, it's absolutely about making sure that we know what each other are doing, not in a competitive way, but in a collaborative way. And that is absolutely the key, I think, in culture to making a successful city. Yeah. And so, so Jane, kind of part of that, you know, you're, you're um, on Culture Aberdeen, which I'm not sure that everybody necessarily knows, but we have a 10-year cultural strategy. Um, you know, for Aberdeen and, and kind of going forward, can you maybe talk a little bit about the aims and objectives and where we are, I suppose, in that in that kind of 10 year journey? 
Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and first of all, just thanks to Mary for bigging up um, Granite Noir. You know, the, the Scotsman this year called Granite Noir one of Scotland's signature festivals, and we've done that in five years. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we are very proud of it. But yeah, we do have a vision for, for culture in the city, and it's a shared vision, and it's an ambitious vision. It's delivered through the cultural strategy for the city, and the strategy is owned by the cultural community. It's led by Culture Aberdeen, which is um, a network of cultural organisations who've come together in the city to deliver the strategy because it's outcome focused. Um, it wasn't sort of um, dreamed up in, in a vacuum as we've, we've been listening to people talking today. You know, it was, it, it was developed in consultation with the um, cultural sector. I mean, it does have artists and creatives at the heart of it, but you know, it was also developed with, with business, with community leaders, with educationalists, with the citizens of Aberdeen. It's a strategy that's got civic support. It's, it's mm -hmm. endorsed by our local authority. And I guess the message um, from the cultural strategy is that we're just much more than a nice to have. You know, Absolutely. we're an integral yeah. part of economic development, of, of city centre regeneration. You know, we touched on um, net zero ambitions there, community capacity building, health and well-being agendas. You know, we're here and we want to contribute to that. We're not claiming that culture can kickstart an economy single-handedly, but if we are restructuring and diversifying the economy, culture is an asset and it's also an agent of change. So yeah, I, I, I don't want to go into chapter and verse, you know, what the, what the cultural strategy yeah. is, but basically there are five ambitions. So forgive me cultural colleagues for a kind of whistle stop version, but you know, it's about making sure that everyone's got access to the arts. It's about mm -hmm. supporting artists and creative practitioners to live, learn and work in the city. It's about making all the city a stage that we've referred to, which is about the physical infrastructure and the festivals. It's about connecting us to the world. And that's about our, interne our international reach. And it's about you know, capacity building within our own sector. And when I've reflected on the cultural strategy in the last year, you know, I've, I've also uh, reflected on how in many ways, COVID has actually just accelerated a lot of what was happening already. So, you know, retail is moving out of town and online. Cultural events bring people into the city. Yeah. Um, you know, we welcome more than a million people through our doors in a year. And when people come to HMT in the Music Hall in the Lemon Tree, as Mary said, they're not just buying a ticket, you know, they're dining, they're having a drink, they're yeah. staying overnight in a hotel, they're taking a taxi. We're a catalyst for, you know, a whole ecosystem out there. And, you know, we're also talking about uh, remote working as the new normal. People who work remotely can choose where they live and um, in choosing an attractive cultural offering is a determinant, you know. Mm -hmm. And right now in the middle of a global pandemic, you know, we're all turning to the arts or certainly many people are turning to the arts to feed our, our social and our spiritual needs, you know, to cope with isolation and loneliness and depression and boredom. In the cultural strategy, it doesn't just address, you know, the economic impacts of the arts. Mm -hmm. It talks about affecting social change, you know, it talks about improving health and well-being, about community capacity building. And, you know, I have to tell you, there are many arts organisations um, in the city that are already doing that, you know, organisations like Station House Media Unit, like Grampian Hospital Art Trust, like Big Noise Tory, um, City Moves ourselves. The, um, I, I, if, I, if I can just jump in, I, I think it was really poignant that Jane just mentioned, um, obviously, Grampian Hospital Art Trust, because, yeah. you know, the work that they've been doing with people is not just about paintings that they hang in the hospital, you know, it's actually going on to the wards with kits uh, for people to be able to, to, I think, work out anxieties through art, the arts and the written word as well as, as drawing, and it's had a huge, huge, um, I think, impact um, on people and I, th I think we have to recognize that it does filter right across so it's not just about you know the, the the social enjoyment of arts it's sometimes about the necessity of art and health and healing so you know I think it's really important that we, we did mention the Grampian um, Hospital Art Trust because they do an amazing amount of work up there. 
Um, we obviously kind of touched there on the kind of pandemic and, and, and COVID. Adrian, normally we, we would have had new art in April. It would normally be the, it would have been Easter weekend off and it's kind of the launch. Um, you know, what, you know, what changes or, or, or what do you think we can expect over the, over the summer? Is new art going to be here in some form? How are we going to be getting people back into the city centre um, and not just enjoying, you know, enjoying it on the screen, getting people back in? You're almost looking for an exclusive there, Elaine. I was, yeah. like <laughs> yeah. uh, Elaine, we're working with the curator uh, in Norway at the moment to safely bring back new art. Because if you understand, the main ingredients are outside. You know, and it yes. is an outside festival. Perfect. So it lends itself very well to, shall we say, uh, an incline towards maybe June, July, August in, in some shape or form. Now, it won't be a full festival. Uh, as it has been previously, where we have the academia coming in, we have mass gatherings, uh, which we all want to see, and they're not too distant. But you can you can imagine the variables are slightly different. Mm -hmm. We need, need to look at safely bringing people in. So it'll be that incremental approach again, where if this pulls through, we'll bring international or national, but with international status, artists from the domestic market, the UK, up to Aberdeen to work very closely with local artists, a local production team. Yeah. So the synergies are there and we will develop a new art festival uh, over a few weekends. Now, a lot of this will be online in the short to medium term, I'm sure, but we will advertise it, position, market Aberdeen for all the reasons that Jane and, and Mary have gone into. So we're quite excited by that. We're making progress. We're identifying the canvas etc and, it, and it's it's allowing us to go back into an area that we, we desperately want to get back into because since when march last year as a business improvement district like so many other self-respecting businesses we've almost had to rip up our business plan we've had to be on the ground supporting our businesses our levy peers to get through day to day with the, with this the loans the grants the, the marketing required when we were able to open, then we would close again. We've introduced a gift card to the city centre. So you can see we've got a lot closer to our levy pairs with the here and nows. But of course, we want to push out and and, and take the, the cultural offer in that step further and working with Jane, Marietta, uh, and obviously New Art might be the starting point for that. And I think, you know, psychologically, that'll be a, a real boon, a real fillip for the, for the city, the northeast. And internationally, if we can see that a street art festival of this magnitude is coming to a city centre near you. Yeah, and no, I, I, and as you say, it's outside and it, it's all about, you know, exploding and, and seeing your city in a different way. And actually, it, the, the fact that it's it, it's not done in a big splash and you just might turn the corner and there's the new piece of art is actually part of the exciting bit. You know, and I think people, a lot of people forget about the small bits, you know, when you walk down Langston, the small bits that are on the walls that you forget about because you often just think about the big ones. Um, Indeed, Elaine, and we've got so many legacy pieces that yeah. you're alluding to, you know, that we've yeah. got more than a, a healthy trail, shall we say. And again, that will hopefully stimulate people to come in safely to the city centre and, and utilise our lovely retail and, and our hospitality and all the rest that goes with that. So you can see why we are very keen to see a return to the, the street art festival that is new art. Yeah, M Mali, um, the mm -hmm. only time I have been to Teka on PNG Live in the past year is to get my first COVID back, my <laughs> first vaccination. Um, you obviously must be keen to get, you know, kind of conferences and live events, you know, back, because as you've mentioned before, they come with that, that fantastic spend, you know, for the, for the other, it's the knock-on part. Um, you know, and, and, and the art gallery, you know, do you want to kind of talk about where, where you see us kind of going with these places? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, the PNG Live has been a huge um, undertaking for the city. Um, but, you know, we're, we're absolutely delighted that we provided this new conference and exhibition centre um, because it was needed. Our old one had done its job, but, yeah. you know, it was it was past it. And people are looking out for a, a far better experience and capabilities. Um, and, and that's what the new centre does, you know, and the amount of acts that we had booked in there, you know, people like Elton John, etc., where we've never seen them and would have had to travel to Glasgow or Edinburgh for before, you know, we're now the preferred destination because we've got far better exhibition centre. Um, so, you know, put a plug out there for, for our, our P&J Live. But, you know, the art gallery, again, you know, that was a major investment for the city. And, you know, we, I took a few bricks for uh, some of the, the, ch the choices we made. But, you know, I don't regret a minute of 
or a penny that we spent on it, because it really has been heralded by the arts world as a, a major success. And there's nothing uh, sort of more um, obvious than when we won Museum of the Year, mm -hmm. which was a, an amazing feat. And, um, you know, it's a highly um, regarded award. And it's allowed us to invest in local artists and do micro commissions and a, an artist in residency, you know, and also to employ staff to be able to assist local artists. So, you know, it, it's really given us a, a, a real opportunity for having a globally recognized award to help on a local footprint. It, it, it's really welcome. We obviously had the BP Portrait Award, which unfortunately, uh, sorry, exhibition, but we lost a month of that because we had to go back into lockdown. But um, we have, and again, this is a ma massive accolade. We've got the British Art Show coming. Now, this is a show that only happens once every five years. So, uh -huh. you know, it's not something that's every year and everyone's had, you know, this is a huge, huge accolade. And again, you know, it was on the, they, they had a, a TV show discussing it. And, you know, the, the comments that were made about Aberdeen's art gallery and the transformation there, you know, absolutely endorsed everything that we'd hoped would be delivered through it. But for me, it was more than just about the big, the big sort of awards that we might win. It was about making sure that it was accessible for everyone. Yeah. And before, you know, if you were disabled, you were put into the goods lift to be moved around the building. That's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. Equal accessibility for everyone and you know but we've got, we've got the art show again at prime time July 10th of July this year it comes till the 10th of October um, and that will attract attract people from all over to come and see this amazing show um, with some of the you know the best of uh, British contemporary art um, so you know we're really really excited about that we've got Xandra Rhodes coming which had which she was due earlier, but has had to be rescheduled to later. I think it's November this year. So, you know, we're absolutely punching above our weight. If you look at the size of our city, but we don't see ourselves just as a city. We see ourselves as a region um, and yeah. the city for a region. So, you know, the art gallery and the exhibition centre are key regional offerings. They happen to be delivered by the city because, you know, you've got a great city council, but <laughs> have to get that plug in. But no, I mean, the, the, the efforts that FP has gone to to make Aberdeen a destination through the ex uh, through exhibitions coming to the art gallery, through the, the festivals that we've just talked about, you know, I don't think you can underestimate the draw that that will have. We've obviously got Provost Skeen's house that's going to be opening shortly, and that's obviously COVID dependent, but the Hall of Heroes, which again recognizes the immense talent that is in Aberdeen in the Northeast, you know, and the, the things we have done. Some of the people are, are, are departed from the planet that will be exhibited there, but there's some people that are still, um, you know, here with us today. So, you know, there's so many things that Aberdeen has got happening for it at the moment that we should be extremely proud. Um, and yes, we've got, the, as I say, the big ticket things are the exhibition center, are the art gallery, the music hall, HMT, but it's all the grassroots things that circulate around that to make these places um, sing, I suppose, is what we should be really focusing on. Um, and one of the ones that, you know, I remember, and I'm sure you might remember Elaine as a child, is the, the student torture. Yeah. Um, and we weren't being tortured by students, although it felt <laughs> as they were chasing you with our money cans. That's but, nice. you know, that seems to have resurrected itself to be coming back into um, an annual event. But, you know, I'd love to see that be featured in and in, in with other stuff around it and make that a real platform, almost um, festival in its own right. I mean, the universities do do festivals. We've got the Look Again Festival, uh, sorry, festival with um, Robert Gordon's. And there's the, the May Festival with Aberdeen University. So, you know, everybody's playing their part. And that's what's really exciting. You know, it, it's not defined just by one person. It's defined by a city. And I think we've all got behind it. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose kind of, kind of Jane just kind of building on that and the kind of local thing. And believe it or not, my first pay packet was from the Scottish Ballet. Um, because as a nine year old, I, I, I danced in the Nutcracker for the Christmas season. Ooh. So I remember it. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you think we, we are doing enough, um, you know, for to encourage young artists? Is there, can people see that there's places that they can go, you know, getting a taste for the bright lights or, you know, exploring their artistic side? Do you think we're, we are doing enough um, to stimulate that element. Um, I, I do. You know, I don't. I don't think we should ever be complacent. There, there's, uh, there's always more that we, that we can do. But you know, it's important 
that young people have a voice because they're the next generation of artists and audiences. And there are lots of examples of young people, not just participating in the arts in the city, but actually involved in shaping the offering in the city, co-creating it alongside, you know, artists and arts organisations. You know, you talked about the music hall earlier. The music hall was very much, um, the, the, the message was a new hall for a new generation of artists and audiences. And we recruited um, music hall young ambassadors to help us to reimagine um, the hall. Our young ambassadors symbolic turned the key to unlock the doors on our mm -hmm. reopening weekend and um, during the project we set up a music hall babies project these babies I think they'll be four this year <laughs> <laughs> but they were born um you know in December 2017 exactly a year before the music hall opened and we've mm -hmm. kept in touch with those babies and their families ever since the, um, we've got a new creative learning studio in the music hall and that's the new home for our youth theatre and our youth music programme we talked about. Um, we've got a new youth arts festival like the Blue, we, we, I think we'd only had one year of it and then we had Covid and then we're trying to do something digitally this year but that again is a, a, a festival, it's not just an Aberdeen performing arts festival, our aspiration that it's a festival that we coordinate contributions mm -hmm. from young people um, and arts organisations across the city. Um, during Covid we've been working with our youth theatre on a project called Positive Stories for Negative Times and it's a response to the pandemic you know we can't come together in physical spaces to to be creative so we've made a space for young people to come together online to create mm -hmm. and we're very excited because I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a plug now because yes. um, <laughs> this evening we're premiering a new work that's been written specially for our young people and um, it's a pro this is a project that we're doing in partnership with a company called Wonderfuls and the, the Traverse Theatre in, in Edinburgh. And, you know, I, I don't just want to talk about Aberdeen Performing Arts. Um, there are lots of cultural organisations in the city that are supporting and encouraging young people to participate in the arts and give them, you know, the kind of experience that, that you talked about there, those formative experiences yeah. that you never forget, you know, the, th the thrill of it all. But, you know, so, so just to give a couple of examples, the Belmont Film House has... Kind of has young programmers. Um, Peacock Visual Arts supports young curators. Station House Media Unit is skilling up young people across seven regeneration areas mm -hmm. in, in video and radio production. Um, City Moves Dance Agency is currently um, doing online dance classes for young people. There's Big Noise Tory. And I would say as well, you know, that these projects cost money and we all raise funds ourselves mm -hmm. to, to, to make them happen. Culture Aberdeen's just secured £300,000 for artists uh, to make a response to COVID, for artists and communities to respond to COVID. We, we raised £30,000 this year for a project we're very excited about getting started on. It's, you know, access to the arts for more vulnerable um, children and young people. Um, the Belmont Film House at the moment is uh, working really hard to secure um, funding for the city to become a climate beacon. So that's a project that's linked into COP26. So, you know, I'm, I'm not great at kind of retaining all those kind of figures about, you know, the economic benefits of the arts, but I do know that for every pound that Aberdeen Performing Arts receives in public subsidy, we generate another seven pounds. And I also know that um, every pound that Aberdeen City Council grants to external cultural organisations generates, um, in set terms of a return on investment, generates about the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just, you know, kind of Adrian, I know you've mentioned um, kind of before in terms of new art pulling in the, the kind of local artists and, and, and part of that, you've got the kind of community outreach, um, you know, programme as well. Do you want to talk a little bit uh, again? You know, I remember the, the um, at the top of uh, St Nicholas, you know, all the, all the youngsters being encouraged to come in and do the, um, the rubbings and things like things like that. So you pull in uh, young people um, as well. Do you want to maybe mention that? 
Yeah, it, it, it was a good point Mari made, you know, and it could be easy to, to criticise us for, for taking in international artists. You know, there was a, a real attractiveness about bringing the brightest and the best from across the world to Aberdeen, but we have to build legacy. And I think the others have rightly touched on that, you know, and we were acutely aware that we would have to, and, and, and I say have, uh, you know, it was the right thing to do was to get upstream and work with the city council through education and, and engage all the schools, you know, and it was fascinating how many schools got involved with their projects, even my two boys who haven't got an artistic bone in their body. <laughs> Sorry, Jane, you'll argue with that because they have, but it, it's well hidden, below the football boots. Uh, you know, and they're coming back telling me who their favourite new art artist is, you know, and that that was powerful to me, if you allow me to, to home in on the Watson mm -hmm. family. And that said a lot. So if that's being replicated right across the city, the region, because Mary's right, we're a regional capital city here, and we need to engage better with the provinces out there and, inter and nationally and internationally, because new art uh, was also, you know, when I speak about these projects, they also had a project one of the schools in Newcastle on New Art Aberdeen, you know, which again is quite interesting. So there's, there, there is a product there, but it was also important, as Mary said, that we got all demographics, all ages, all persuasions, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds engaged in this. And we, we tried to hit the regeneration areas to, to involve more people to come in to the city to involve themselves in some of those projects, but the more senior people in society as well in the Lata 65 project, which hails from Portugal, which is, as Mari says affectionately, the graffiti grannies, who ended up on the one show, who ended up on ITV, uh, the breakfast show as well. So they got some uh, mass appeal. Indeed, 10 million people in Russia watched them uh, doing something. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, and, and we just need to build on that, you know, because yeah. we have a yeah, we're a business organisation and yeah, we're here ultimately for the, the 800 or so levy peers that we have in the city centre, but we understand that we need to be inclusive. We need to get people into the city centre doing the right things, that this becomes a destination of choice. And people yeah. aren't using the city centre at crisscross. They're more likely to come here, enjoy the experience where there's more pedestrian friendly areas, dare I say, if we could stray into master plan thinking in the future, have that daytime economy, seamlessly transition into an evening economy where everybody benefits so that they're there involving a wonderful retail uh, retail offering in the city centre and then going to one of Jane's wonderful places in the evening to pick up a, a cultural offering or one of the many other places that we'll have in that area of expertise in the city. So it all comes together really. Yeah, the, the, and one of the ones I liked was, um, you know, where children were encouraged to get a picture from the art gallery and you know, find mm -hmm. it with the peace stops outside that kind of then encourage people to go back in, in into the art gallery. I'm kind of before I'm going I'm going to be coming to you to ask you about your 10 year vision, but we've got a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna just kind of um ask you about those. Um talking about, you know, we're an area of dynamic culture, you know, steeped in history and dramatic coastal and mountain uh, landscapes, um, which is unique to us. Yeah, it's saying that friends and acquaintances from the Central Belt regions continue to dismiss Aberdeen and criticise the city. Um, why do you think there's such a disconnect between the perception of Aberde perceptions of Aberdeen and its fantastic offering and how do we break that barrier? And that's a little bit touching on, I suppose, Jane, you know, when you came here, how, how you saw Aberdeen and do you think we've kind of we, we, we've broken those barriers down a bit? Yeah, no, I definitely think I think we're we're working on it, and I, I I do think, and I think the oil and gas sector has brought so much to Aberdeen, and I'd be the last person, you know, we we need it, we want it, we're work, we're working on renewables, but it, you know, it it has overshadowed any other story in town, and you know, I'm going to tell you another story of when I came to Aberdeen at first, and I probably shouldn't, it was it was you know it. it it kind of surprised me, you know, I, again, another reception that I was at early on, I was interest, introduced to someone who worked in oil and gas at a very high level, they have these like titles like um, senior world president, you know, yeah. <laughs> someone like that, and and, um, and, he said, and I was introduced as the new chief executive of Aberdeen Performing Arts, and um, he said to me, oh, arts, you know, we don't need arts in Aberdeen, the only place you need Aberdeen is places where they don't have anything else, like, like Dundee, you know, <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. You know, I, I you know, it, 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 you know, so, so I, I'm not underestimating the challenge that we've had, but actually, I think we've moved on from that significantly. And I mentioned earlier, you know, the Scotsman saying, um, it, it, Granite Noir, one of one of Scotland's signature literature festivals, you know, the British Art Show. 
these that we have to tell that story you know we have a responsibility mm -hmm. as as um as a city and as a cultural community to tell that story um and you know believe me we're out there doing that and i i think things are beginning to change you know things don't happen overnight but um some ways that's been you know the, the impact of covid you know if there's if there's anything positive that's come out of that i think it has actually made people appreciate the importance and the significance of arts and culture in their life and my goodness you know like Ab you're right you know aberdeen is the most it's such a beautiful city you know it, it's got so many assets you know culture is just one of them but we've got a coastline that's been um you know it was named one of the most iconic coastlines in the world you've got the, the hinterland of you know going to balmoral so I, I suspect, as we all have to start thinking more about staycations, that we'll, we'll start seeing more people in Aberdeen. And when you come to Aberdeen, you can't miss the cultural offering. Yeah, and just kind of picking up on that was one of the other questions. Also picking up on the coast, I'm just going to kind of maybe put that to you, you know, Mary, and talking about the renaissance of the beachfront, and you know, is the coast being factored into the growth of visitors to the to the city and um, the city centre? Yeah, I mean, I think connectivity is a huge, huge issue that in people's minds about how things link up. And part of the, the, the initial master plan, one of the things was about sort of transport and connectivity. So, you know, that is very much at the forefront. In fact, I was going around the city centre yesterday with um, Steve White, and we were talking about where we thought there needed to be interventions in terms of connectivity. Um, and how we join up the beachfront to the city centre, making it far more accessible so that they're, you know, well, whether you've got a visual barrier between you, it's, it's about taking down the mental barrier. You know, mm -hmm. you even see it from coming from Union Square to Union Street, people have this kind of, oh, how do I get there? You know, it's different, I think, if you've grown up here and you know all the back lanes and things. But, you know, I think there is a, a concern that perhaps, um, people are not as clear how to move around the city and how to access the waterfront. But the waterfront, again, was a project in the master plan. But what we didn't want to do at that time, we kind of parked it to the side to come back to, because if you, if you have too big a footprint, you, you have the scatter effect and you, you don't really make a huge progress. So as we do the beachfront, you know, and in fact, there's a paper coming to our city growth and resources committee in May, which will identify some um, investigations that we need to do about the beachfront. Obviously, you know, some of it will be what you can and can't do in terms of the, the land itself. Yep. So, you know, it will absolutely be included. And what we want to do is to make it far more accessible and, you know, for people to be able to move by foot, by bike, um, but, you know, recognising that, you know, Aberdonians are a, uh, very fond of their cars, you know, and, and we don't want people getting the message that your car is not welcome. What we're trying to do is just say, look, we maybe need you to take a slightly different route into the car park or whatever, because, you know, it's a region, it's a regional destination, and we keep coming yeah. back to that. And, and we don't have the same luxury as Edinburgh and um, Glasgow of having the underground and the tram system. You know, it might be something that may come in the future, um, but, you know, at the moment, you know, we've got what we've got. We're looking at various ideas for um, sort of rapid transport, but, you know, we're very aware about connectivity. The coastal uh, pathways that we have are amazing yeah. for going for walks, you know, and again, you know, we're looking at how we, we make sure that they're all connected so you can basically walk from the top of Scotland down to, you know, um, our Broth or Montrose or whatever. So, you know, we're very acutely aware that people um, love active movement. And, and you know, if you look at Northeast Open Studios, um, which is a, an amazing art, festival that goes on in, in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, you know, that that often sort of hogs a lot of the coastal um, villages and goes into, you know, people's garages and homes and everything. So, you know, we recognise that the coast has, has influenced an awful lot of people's artistic temperaments. Yeah. But we also recognise that, that it's a destination for people just to go for walking. Um, and certainly the waterfront, I think, has always been under not underutilized, but it's maybe not been as well planned out. Now there was a master plan for it before I was involved, which never came to fruition. And my view is if you're doing a master plan, don't give me something that hasn't got a deliverable in it. So, you know, this is why we're refreshing, looking at the beachfront and saying, right, let's identify key things, um, you know, and we've all heard about the football stadium, <laughs> which, you know, 
may or may not stay within the city centre um, around the beachfront. Uh, we've got the, you know, the water sports like, such as surfing, um, you know, that community there are really engaged and want to be involved in any redevelopment along the beachfront. You know, we've got obviously Transition Extreme down there. Other adventure sports, we've got the ice rink, we've got the beach ballroom, so that, the, you know, the, and the Cadonas, you know, so there's a lot of raw ingredients and it, it's how we put them together and adapt and enhance them. And, and again, for active travel, um, whether that's leisure cycling or, or sort of for work cycling, you know, we want to make sure that we, we have a joined up approach along that. So all of it will come together. Um, you know, but you know yourself, Rome wasn't built in a day. And I think people can get frustrated because we have the ideas. But by the time you go through, particularly when you're a public body, there's so many consultations and bureaucracy that seems to have to be gone through before you can actually get onto the ground. I mean, we've got Union Terrace Gardens, which has gone on forever, but you know, by the end of this year, we'll be here. So, yeah. you know, that there absolutely is um, a way forward. Unfortunately, we've got to go through the process of approvals at committees and other things, but no, we will be looking at a joined up approach with our waterfront and our city centre. I'm just I'm kind of conscious conscious of the time as we, we, we draw to the end. and I think we could probably chat um, all day. So I'm going to put you each a little bit on the spot. Um, okay. so 10 years time, you've got, you've, you've moved forward. Um, you know, is there something that you would want to see in the city or want Aberdeen to be known as in terms of a, a kind of culture? So Adrian, I'm going to come, come to you in 10 years time. What do you want to, um, to have seen or Aberdeen inspired to have achieved culturally? Uh, well, the constituent parts, I would like to see more people living and working in the city centre. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's key elements, as Mari will tell you, of the city centre master plan, city living. And, and I do get this this utopian feel that we'll all be working from home. I think that's started to dissipate some of that thinking now. At the very least, there'll be a blended approach. And my hope is that we can consolidate a lot of the office sector in the city centre, because many an expert will tell you, build from your city centre out mm -hmm. to the wider city and the region with that as well. That we become that visitor attraction, Jane touched on right at the start, that destination of choice. Remember, amongst all those assets that we've all been uh, liberally sprinkling about in these presentations, uh, we've got South Harbour and yeah. there will be cruise ships coming in with thousands uh, coming into the city. And again, the potential to, to en enjoy the, the wide range of cultural offering and all that goes with that. So building on the festivals, you know, those that we already have. But again, Jane said, no room for complacency. So it's taken it to the next level. So that I suppose I hear less in the city, for instance, and I'll give you an example, and it says so much about the Northeast psyche, dare I see it. But we're down in the green and inspired nights. It's a beautiful summer's day, and we have that food and drink and music festival, and it was a real good vibe, as they say. And we had some of the best street art in the world, are done in our walls with the smug piece in the in the green area if you're familiar with the city and somebody turned to us to say it's almost like being in edinburgh <laughs> <laughs> and you know my point to that and is a serious one and i'm with jane my glass is always half full we've got so much to offer and i think the tide has turned but there is still a sense sometimes that everything south of stone haven is that bit shinier when in reality it isn't as so many of us are very proud to be up here. There's lots to enjoy. I don't see many Aberdonians moving necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and I extend that to the wider Northeast. Be proud of this, you know, and I, and I often say, one for you, Mary, bring it into the schools about these heroes that we have. Bring it into education. Get right upstream and, and tell people about the, the, the Northeast history and all that goes with it and what the city has achieved. So have I answered your question? I don't know, Elaine, but I yeah, feel no, no, better for that little bit. I'm going to ask Elaine, <laughs> what's, what's, yeah. what's your vision for, or, you know, will we have achieved the 10-year uh, cultural strategy, I suppose? Well, I mean, I, I think Adrian's painted a fantastic picture there. I mean, from, so for me, I suppose, just building on that a little bit, I mean, I think we'll only truly be a city of culture when the citizens of Aberdeen tell us that we're a city of culture and yeah. not just the arts community and the powers that be. It's not, you know, a top-down accolade. It's a, it's a, it's a bottom-up thing that you earn. So in 10 years time, when I'm uh, walking down Union Street and I randomly stop someone in the street and ask them to tell me three things about Aberdeen, 
you know, they say to me, it's got a oh, fantastic art gallery, it's got a great music scene, and there's a festival every month of the year, you know, so in 10 years, we're a city where uh, our story is universally known, Go, you know, going back to that question, you know, uh, we're a city where our story is universally known, and everyone's proud to be an ambassador for the arts, and, you know, pr in 10 years' time, um, I'd like to see Aberdeen as being the home of choice for artists and mm -hmm. creatives. And, um, we'll, you know, that's not happened yet. It's been a very expensive city to live in and yeah. artists, quite frankly, can't afford to live here. And we need that creative community in the city. So we need, you know, through the cultural strategy, we want to take the, the steps to, to make um, Aberdeen attractive to artists, more studio space, more affordable accommodation, more support for creative startups, more work, more commissions, more of our um, creative and cultural graduates from our universities being retained in this city, keeping those young people not, you know, going off um, to take their talent elsewhere. And, you know, in terms of the physical infrastructure, um, I think we're ahead of the game. I don't think we need to wait 10 years. We've done yeah. so much already. But, you know, Mary mentioned the next phase of the master plan. So I would like to see culture at the heart of Queen Street redevelopment and maybe addressing some of those issues, you know, around um, artist accommodation and studio space. So, Mary, if you heard all of that, all of these things we need to pack <laughs> into the city centre uh, master plan, what's, what, what would you like to see? Okay, well, I, I think, you know, th there's a couple of things I, I would say before I say what I would like to see. Um, you know, and the amount of people that I've spoken to who have been, if you like, incomers to Aberdeen, who have been moved here through their work and have come here kind of kicking and screaming. Well, when they've been trying to be moved on, they're kicking and screaming, it's got an awful lot louder because they said, wow, you know, I've been to more cultural activities than I've been, you know, these are people that lived in London, than I've been to, you know, in London in all my life. I've spent, you know, in the last few years, I've, I've visited more things in Aberdeen um, and experienced more things in Aberdeen than I have ever done down there, because it's it's such an easy city to move around and, and to access these, these offerings. So, you know, people might not choose Aberdeen willingly to start with, but they certainly, once they get here, they become indoctrinated to, <laughs> into becoming an Aberdonian. Um, yeah. But, you know, what we do want is we want people to have, uh, you know, a desire to come here because the quality of life generally, you know, we've won so many awards on that. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think there might be a little bit sorry grapes that those dismiss us down in the central belt, because the thing is, we're not trying to replicate what they have. You know, we've yeah. always been about Aberdeen and its own individual identity rather than jumping on somebody else's bandwagon. So what I'd like to see is obviously the festival we've got, I think the festivals are amazing. Um, I think there's room for expansion and all of those, because I think sometimes if you have too many, you start to dilute their their, their kind of um, quality. So what I'd like to see is to, to build on those, because I think we've got some amazing festivals. Again, I think it's important that we always review um, and do a, a bit of a stock check on what we've got when to make sure that it's it's sitting well in, in that time of the year. Uh, so, you know, absolutely, I can give you assurance, culture will stay at the heart of the next phase of the city centre master plan. Um, you know, I took on uh, culture as my portfolio 10 years ago, and um, it's not because I'm an expert in any of the cultural fields. I mean, I have actually performed in a ballet tutu <laughs> on the stages, not of HMT, but of the Art Centre. Um, I've also dressed up as a dice in Pinocchio on the Art Centre stage, so I, but that was many years ago. It wasn't just last week. <laughs> so, you know, again, we've seen the Art Centre being a, a home for an awful lot of homegrown talent that has left the city and actually has come back to the city mm -hmm. because they want to, to, to apply their um, talent here. And, you know, I know that Jane will be aware of some of them. So, you know, people, I, I was speaking to somebody just recently who's working for the National Theatre of England, who wants to come back and work out of Aberdeen and to be able to direct and create in Aberdeen. So, you know, there's an absolute recognition, I think, amongst the industry that Aberdeen is on the up in terms of cultural. But I think I would agree with Jane, what we want people to do, you know, the everyday citizen of Aberdeen, I mean, we've, as I said, we've always been a bit shy, a bit retiring and, you know, a bit naysayer at times. 
but yeah. God help anybody who criticizes our city that's not from the city. <laughs> we're, we're, we're extremely defensive. And if I, if I listen to my mother, if there's any negative stuff in the newspaper, she's like, do they not know about all the lovely parks and all the flowers? And, you know, so we do, we've got so many raw ingredients to make ourselves and continue to be a great city, but we need the attitude from every single person to follow it. And whether you're the taxi driver taking somebody in from the airport or the railway station, your first thing, your last thing you should say to that person in your cab, something positive about the city. And if we all do that, that's when we become a successful city because we can do everything at the council. We can do everything in culture, but unless we want to get behind it as an individual, as a city, you know, as a citizen, you know, we will always come up against it. And I think, you know, even if we get to 99%, I'll take that. But, you know, I think what will make us successful is when we believe we're successful and, and, and stop being so, um, you know, scared to speak out and defend your city and promote your city. Because if we don't do it, nobody else will do it for us. You no, know, I, I think that's right. I think Jane's point, you know, every, everyone is a cultural ambassador. You know, I think I think that's kind of the, the, the message to take away. Um, I'm conscious of my time. So um, I think, you know, if I can draw it so close by thanking the three of you, um, you know, for giving up your time, for sharing your thoughts, you know, on, on Aberdeen and all that we have to offer. We clearly have a lot to offer on the artistic and, and cultural uh, side. Um, from Brody's point of view, our next webinar is going to be on the 20th of May and it's going to look at tourism and hospitality. So all the people that are coming in to view the culture and the artistic side, we're going to look at the kind of tourism and hospitality aspect. And, and to everyone that was uh, listening today, thank you for, uh, for joining us. I was going to leave you with, with a quote, and it's a quote from, um, from Charles Darwin, uh, who said, if I have to, had to live my life over again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week. Wise words from him. I think we should all be subscribing to that. Um, enjoy the rest of the week, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Elaine. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.